So first of all, uh, clap, please. Thanks. Thanks. That makes me feel better. So um, crowd controlling again, that's a really, really uh, clickbait title. Uh, so it will not be that fun. This talk will not be that fun. Uh, I mean, we'll, we will have a small game at the end, but to understand uh, how uh, this game is going, why this game is going to be cool uh, in its implementation, we have to uh, dive into Elixir a bit first. So who knows what Elixir is first? All right, you should you should read more. Uh, just kidding. So, um, so we will have a, a small introduction to Elixir that will take up most of the talk. Uh, so it will not be very small, um, and then we will dive into the game. So, w what is Elixir? Um, it's a functional, concurrent, full tolerant, distributed programming language that runs on the Erlang virtual machine. So that's a lot of stuff to. Uh, say about it, but I will, um, we will break it down and uh, see all of, the, all of those steps. Um, so first of all, um, just a small introduction. My name is Andrea. I work uh, at a company called Football Addicts uh, in uh, Sweden, and, we, and I'm part of the Elixir court team, um, and we use Elixir at work. Uh, the, there's a little logo of the company in there, so... Uh, I thank them for sending me here. Um, and we use Elixir at work um, every day, so it's pretty, uh, at least that says it's kind of stable to use. Uh, so what is Elixir? Uh, we said functional language. So first thing, um, let's see the functional part. So this is IEX, is the shell uh, Elixir, interactive Elixir. Um, so the core of the language, there is uh, just data and function. Data is just uh, pure, uh, immutable, um, transparent data. Uh, it doesn't have any behavior attached to it. So, yeah, we have like numbers, you have lists, uh, you have strings, um, you have a bunch of basic data types, and uh, they're all immutable, meaning that if I, uh, for example, uh, delete an element from a list, of course, um, it just, will just return a new list uh, without the element that I deleted. Uh, it's not modifying the list, the original list. So all uh, data is immutable. It doesn't encapsulate any behavior, so data is just transparent. Uh, and the other component, of course, is, is function, being a, a functional programming language. And with functions, you manipulate data, right? So if, for example, you have a function called, uh, I don't know, um, toString, uh, and I can say pass a number to it, and it will return uh, the string with the number in it instead of the number. Um, so that's basically just the core of the language is data and functions. And then you have uh, what you saw before, list delete. Uh, this is list is the module name, so modules are just collection of functions. Delete is a function that is part of the list module. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you have anonymous functions as well, like similar to JavaScript. So this is an anonymous, fu an anonymous function that takes a parameter, for example, and adds one to the, that parameter. Uh, so this is just, just a value. I can apply that function to a value and get another value back. This is just anonymous uh, function. I can assign uh, this to a variable called the variable. It's pretty. I can pass functions to other functions, so you have all the high uh, order order function stuff. It's pretty standard uh, functional programming stuff. Uh, and this is really, really the core of the language, just data and functions. But then uh, comes, a, and this is not really interesting part, I would say, especially if you're familiar with uh, functional programming. If you're not, uh, you're, you're going to get it uh, while we talk. Uh, and um, the really, really um, big thing about Elixir and Erlang um, so as I said, Elixir runs on the Erlang virtual machine, meaning that it just compiles to Erlang bytecode. So once you compile Elixir, uh, you can't distinguish from Erlang anymore. Um, and Erlang is a language that was, uh, it's pretty old, it's like 25 years ago, 30 years ago maybe. Um, and it was built to handle 
um, like switch, telephone switches and, uh, and uh, networks uh, and uh, telephone calls mostly. Uh, uh, so it's by, by nature designed to be really, really uh, distributed. Uh, it works really well in, in distributed environments. It's uh, built, it was built to be uh, concurrent and full tolerant just because it couldn't go down because you can't uh, hang up people while they're, they're talking just to update uh, switches. Uh, and so you get all that for free in Elixir as well. Um, and the concurrent part, I think, is probably the most interesting, maybe. Uh, definitely the hardest to wrap your head around, but um, so let's, let's just see what it is. Uh, so in, in Elixir and Erlang, you have this concept of processes. Um, and processes are, are just, um, are not, this is really important distinction, they're not operating system processes. So an operating system process is something that uh, the oper operating system manages uh, and um, it, it allocates resources for it and all this stuff. Um, and it's usually, usually quite expensive to uh, spawn, right? So your computer uh, runs, I don't know, 1,000, 10,000 maybe uh, processes, likely not more than that. But an Elixir process or Erlang process, it's the same thing. Uh, they're really, really, really lightweight. Um, and they're handled inside the Erlang virtual machine. So Erlang as a virtual machine, uh, like, like Java. Um, and this virtual machine handles the uh, processes. So, um, and the virtual, virtual machine is made by a bunch of actual OS operating system processes. Uh, but the, the, the Elixir processes are not operating system processes. They're really just lightweight. Um, lightweight, I mean, you can, can spawn like a million processes, two million processes on the same machine, and it will work. Uh, they're really, really lightweight. Um, and the concurrency is managed for you by the virtual machine, so you actually see these processes as being parallel, uh, same as operating system processes, but that's managed for you by the, the virtual machine, which means that it's still they also uh, cross-platform uh, and they work. Um, so the process in Elixir is the smallest unit of computation. So when you execute some Elixir code, you're doing that in a process. Um, the shell that we're in is actually a process, so each process is identified by a uh, process ID, a PID, uh, and the self function returns the PID of the current process, so we can see that the shell is actually a process. So we, we can't execute any uh, Elixir code outside of a process. And um, so um, in the process, the code that you execute in the same process is sequential, meaning that there's no nothing going around, like happening in parallel in the same process. So each process executes sequential code. So if I say like, uh, I don't know, sleep for one second here, it will just sleep uh, and not do nothing else. It can't happen anything in parallel in the same process. Um, so then the point is having a, a lot of processes, of course. Um, and to, to create processes, you just spawn processes like similar to like uh, forking, I guess, uh, in the operating system. And when you spawn a process, what you actually spawn is a function. Um, so a function runs that runs it will run in a different process. And this function uh, and the, this process will be linked to this function and will live and die according to this function. So um, it will start when, uh, by running the function and it will peacefully die or uh, not peacefully die when the function finishes. Uh, so for example, I can spawn a process and pass it a function. So I'm calling the spawn primitive and passing a function that will print a string um, to the standard output. I uh, will print the PID of the process, current process, and we will see that it says hello from PID95. Uh, this is just internal numbers. Uh, and it will return, spawn will return, this is the return, return value, return the PID of the uh, process that we spawned, but we can see that this is different than the PID of the process we're in. So we spawned a new process. Um, and this is really just uh, it for processes. And um, so one thing I, I wanna mention now, but it will come uh, in useful later, is that uh, this process has no kind of shared memory. The old, since you know data is immutable, so if you have share, shared memory between processes, it's, it's useless. You, you can't mutate it from one process uh, and read the mutated one from another because there's no way to mutate it. So it's just, uh, there's no shared memory. Each process has its own memory. And we will come back to this. Um, so um, right now, the, the view that we have of Elixir right now is we spawn these processes 
uh, but they they don't communicate, so they execute a function and then die. But they this way they need all the input to do their work. When you start them, right? There's no way to like add uh, input to them or or make them more aware of the surrounding world. And the way you do this, uh, the way you let processes communicate is by um, message passing. So these are really really uh, very uh, core concepts of Elixir, and like most of the stuff that comes after this is built on the just processes and message passing. Uh, and message, pa message passing is just, you have two primitives, one to send a message to a process, uh, and one to receive messages from other processes. Uh, for a message, I mean any Elixir term. You can send any Elixir term. Um, and the sending primitive is just send, so you pass a PID, uh, and then you pass a message that can be anything, uh, or can be a list, for example just anything, any Elixir term, and this will send the message, return the value that it, you sent, and then return right away. So this is a asynchronous operation. So you, you have no confirmation that the process has, has been delivered. Uh, you have guaranteed that it will be delivered at some point in the same node if no errors happen. So it's not really a good guarantee, but um, you have a guarantee that it will be uh, delivered, but you don't know when. You don't know, you're not sure if the process, the other process uh, acknowledged that, that it received the message. You have to implement that manually. Um, so this is asynchronous and returns right away. And then you have, uh, so so this, this function, this is a shell helper that a flush that uh, reads all the messages that you, so in this case, we send the message to the current process, right? We use self, so we actually send the message to the shell process, uh, and the shell has a this helper called flush that uh, shows the message that the shell has in its mailbox, uh, and this it shows that um, this is the message that we sent. This is the return value of of the flush. Uh, so if we send this twice and do flush, we see it tw twice. If we do flush again, we see nothing because there are no messages. Um, but the actual uh, way of receiving messages in a process is the receive construct, so it's receive. Um, and it takes a block and it takes a bunch of message shapes, let's say, and action to execute when that, the message with that shapes arrives. So for example, here, I will accept a message with any shape and say, uh, I received this message. Um, then this ends the block. And so what happens now, so receive is a, is a blocking operation and it will block uh, until it gets a message that matches the one of the patterns, so in this case, any message here. Um, uh, so when, uh, until it receives a message, it will just block. So right now we're screwed, because uh, we, I mean, we, we can't send a message to the shell anymore because we're, uh, the shell is blocked. So we just, this this case, we just need to exit and start again. But, um, so let's, let's do what we did earlier and first send a message to the shell send hello, so the colon syntax is just uh, like that data type called atom, but let's send a string. Um, send self hello. Uh, we don't flush, otherwise we remove the message from the mailbox, but we can do the same thing. I had to just copy here. And you see that it actually executes and returns, but it blocked uh, until the message was uh, sent. So what we can do even cooler, we can actually say process Oops, send after, and we can send uh, a message. This will send a message to um, the, the given process after a given timeout. So we, let's say, uh, I have no idea about the order of the arguments. All right, so let's say this sends, sends after 10, uh, let's say 15 seconds. That's 15,000 milliseconds. Then I have to be really fast and just do this again. And I will, we will wait, that was too fast. Uh, now we will wait a, a bunch, and a while, and then we will see I received hello in the meantime. Um, so these are just really the two, there you go. Uh, these are really the two primitives, processes and message passing, and everything else is basically built around this. Um, so this is not, um, so the, all of this is, uh, I think is uh, like important to understand in order to understand why the, game at the end will be cool. Uh, but um, a bit a small digression that is not really important to understand why it will be cool, but so if you have th this message passing and, and uh, 
um, processes are also the way you actually have shared memory in Elixir. So given you can't have shared memory just based on data because data is immutable, the way you have shared memory is basically you keep this data in a process and then you ask this process to give you the data that it has through message passing. So you send it a message saying, please give me the data, and it, you program this process, of course, to tell, send the data back to you, and you will have this state. And then you can actually send a message that says, I've updated this state, and you maybe give uh, another function that, um, you, sorry, give another, another updated state, and this process will uh, loop again uh, with the same state, uh, and with a new state, sorry, and send the state back to you. Uh, and this is like this is really abstract stuff, but I have a really small example that we, we can actually write uh, about a process that call, that keeps state, and then that's how you do shared memory. And the way this is this is called actors usually. So if you're familiar with actor actor model, this is basically how it works. So we can define a module uh, state. Uh, we need the module because we need a named function. And in this uh, module, we can we can um, define a function called loop, and this function takes a state. Uh, so then what we do? We block in it here, and we block until we get a message. And like I really like this implementation because it's just really, really elegant, in my opinion. So I will do the most like contrived implementation that does just one thing, and it will like be really, really generic implementation of an actor. But let's say we get a, a message called get an update, um, and we will get a sender, basically, um, and uh, um, function. And this like curly braces syntax is just tuples, so it's like a list with a, let's say, fixed number number of elements for now. Um, and so what so what I'm doing here, I'm matching on the structure of this uh, message. Uh, so if I get the message and get an update, will be it's just a, like a fixed value, um, like a string, uh, literal. Uh, this will be the um, PID of the, the sender because we don't when we receive a message we don't know who sent it so we ask the sender to explicitly tell us and this is just a generic function that as to uh, we'll have to take one argument which is the state and return two values which is the value that I want that I'm interested in and the new state um, and then uh, this I, I will show uh, so if we get this message what we do is we call the function, so we say like function, we call it on the state, and this will return two values, as I said. We call the first one the get value, and the second one the new state. So we call this function. Then we say um, send to the sender the get value. So we send the value that the function, re first value the function returned back to the sender. And then we call loop again with the new state. And this is like calling loop is actually the thing that makes this, if we call loop again here, you see this process will never die because there's no way this function finishes. It's an infinite recursion, right? There's no clause here that says if something happens, just, just stop. So it will just call itself forever just with the new state, updated state. And in this way, I can send this message from multiple processes and each process can update the state uh, and they can all do it at this, and they, they, have, they will have something like shared memory, uh, even if it's the access to it is serialized because this, this process can only send, um, it can only process one message at a, at a time. So you won't end up with corrupted states, for example. But uh, the idea is that now if I do, for example, uh, state, uh, state PID, actually, and I spawn a function that calls loop and let's say our, our state is just a number, zero. Uh, of course, state.loop. There you go. So if we check now if this process is alive, it's alive, so it's just hanging there, uh, blocked in the receive here, right? So it's just waiting for a message. So if now we send a message, it w uh, sorry, we send it to the state PID and we send get and update, we send self, which is the message we want, the, where we want the message back, and then we send the function that takes the state and returns the state plus one. But it has to return, uh, so let's say it returns the current state, because this, is the, this will be called with the current state of the process, so it returns the current state and then the state updated by one. Uh, this should work, no. Uh, 
Okay, this is the table. Okay. Um, so now we send this message. If we now, let's say, uh, flush. Uh, sorry, this is flush. So we got the message zero anyways, which is the current value that we return here. But if we do this again and then flush, we get the message one now because the, this, the, the process is actually looping with a new state. And if we do it again, we get the message uh, two. If we do it again, but instead of, we return the current, still return the current state here, but then instead of saying plus one, I say plus 100. Uh, and then I flush, I see that it, it replied with a state three because that's the current state. But if I do it again, then I see the state 103, which is the updated state. So this is just, I think it's really, really interesting, but it's not really uh, like interesting for the game, but still interesting. Um, so this is the like really the core of concurrency and message passing uh, in Elixir. Um, so the next big thing I said, Elixir is a concurrent, fault tolerant, distributed uh, language, functional also. Um, and we said so we saw the functional and concurrent part. Uh, now there's another really, really interesting part, which is the full tolerant part. So um, Erlang, as I said, was built to run on actual telephone switches, and it had to like be online 100% of the time, because uh, telephone switches means that, like, I pick up the phone and Erlang code starts running, and then it stops running when I put down the phone. Um, so if I'm on the phone and someone wants to uh, upgrade the program, for example, or if some error happens in one. Uh, telephone switch. I don't want to like, drop the call, all the calls in the telephone switch, right? I only maybe I only want to drop the one that the error uh, happened in, but not all of them. Uh, so it's really focused on being like really re resilient to failures. And the way we do, you do this, um, so as I said before, between processes, not th nothing is shared. The only way to communicate is through processes. But processes do not have access to a like common area uh, where you can store stuff in the language. Uh, so this no, nothing is shared semantics um, mean that the crashes uh, when they happen are really can be really isolated. Because uh, if a process crashes, it doesn't affect any other process. Because uh, they don't have sh like sh shared data, so th they're just, they, the only way they talk is through messages. So if one of them dies, of course messages maybe w will stop uh, coming or being sent, uh, but still there's, there's no shared uh, memory, so the, the crash won't affect other processes. Um, and this is like a, a principle um, that is used a lot uh, throughout the language. And the, the, so the way you use this, uh, this principle is actually using, uh, building your application around uh, processes that, that never die, basically. And these processes are usually supervisors. They're, they're actually called supervisors. And the only um, job of a supervisor process is to supervise other processes and restart these processes when they die or just handle the fact that they died. Um, and basically, um, so the way, the, like primitive that you do is you have a primitive neural line to actually monitor a process and you will get a message when the process dies. So what a supervisor just does is just monitors uh, some processes that you give to it and if they die, uh, it just do some, does something that you tell it to do. Most of the time this means uh, usually to restart processes. Because for example, in the um, telephone call, uh, it doesn't really make sense to restart. But in many applications, if like if my uh, a worker that is doing some work uh, dies, a worker process dies, I usually, it's, it makes sense to restart this process. And re why restarting? Um, so the idea behind restarting is that you want to start from a known state again, right? Because that's what you do when your, your computer gets stuck. You just restart and it works again. Uh, and that's the same thing, basically. You just restart from a known state, and then and then it works again. Uh, and these supervisors are um, their job is just they have built-in like logic to do this, but just to restart uh, other processes. And the the idea is that a supervisor mostly never dies, right? So it, let's say never dies. So the 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 thing that you do, since I said every Elixir process, uh, sorry, every Elixir program runs it in a process. So the way you do is you make the root process. Uh, of your program a supervisor, and then you, your Elixir program never dies, basically. That's the whole thing. So if your Elixir program is a, is a web app, it never dies because the, the, the actual uh, main process is just a supervisor, so that restarts its other processes if they die, but the supervisor itself that never dies. So you actually get um, 
basically an application that never dies, that's the point. And this is not, I mean, I'm not like preaching this uh, in vain, this is actually happens. I mean, we, we in production have application that never died since we shipped them to production for maybe one year. It just never died. Of course, there have been a lot of errors uh, going around uh, and processes were crashed like all the time, but the actual application never stopped, uh, like stopped dead and we had to restart it manually. It just never, never happened. Um, so this is the idea behind supervisors. And supervisors, they're, they're meant to be composable, so a supervisor can supervise Work, some worker processes, but it can actually supervise other supervisors as well. And then you end up with like this really cool supervision tree. Um, and this is actually, we can visualize, oops, we can visu visualize, there's a, call, there's a tool called ob Observer. Uh, there's like graphical interface for your Erlang uh, virtual machine. And if I go to like here, and I, this application is a like concept in, in Elixir, but the bundle of processes that, that have a root process, um, this is the actual Elixir application, and you can see it as some process that uh, spawned another process that spawned a supervisor. This is a supervisor, and it has these two processes that it's supervising. And if I kill, I can say kill process, this one, hopefully we, it will restart. So it just, like it did it very fast, but it just restarted this process, and this process is now back alive. And we didn't even see anything in the shell, actually. But I mean, uh, so if if I kill this, it's the same thing. Cold server, it just restarted. Uh, too fast to see. And this, all these applications. Have, so this is a more, this is a more interesting structure. So you have other like a supervisor that um, spawns a bunch of processes, and this process supervises this other process. Uh, so it's just you can build these like trees um, of supervised processes. And the point is that each supervisor. Uh, supervises an area of the application that then is isolated, so that area uh, can have errors that won't affect the rest of the application because the crashes will be handled by their supervisor. And so you build really can build really complex structures uh, with applications that basically uh, you do everything so that they don't die. Um, and this is like the really the the um, fault tolerance part. So and and this is. Um, and there's this philosophy in Elixir and Erlang that they say let it crash. I really don't agree, but uh, it's 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 like it's a thing. So you can program Erlang uh, in a, in a very declarative way, uh, meaning that uh, y you only program the good good path, right? So you don't handle uh, errors, and and you just let it crash if there's an error. And like the idea is that th there's a supervisor that restarts your process if it dies. So for example, say I'm connecting to a database and there's an error in the connection. What I can do is just like let the process die, crash, or I raise an exception uh, when there's an error. Um, and the supervisor over the process will restart the process and I will try, it will try to connect to the database again. Uh, and if it fails again, it will just die and the supervisor keeps restarting and the process keeps connecting. And of course there are a million like um, ways to do this more properly, but like you can do this, like the, the idea behind it is, is this, you, you just let it crash and someone else will take care of restarting it. Uh, and it will, will never affect, uh, the idea will never affect the whole uh, application. Uh, and this is really uh, all there is to it for now for, for, for tolerance uh, and uh, the only, la the last thing that I mentioned about Elixir is that it's a distributed language as well. This is, uh, I will just skim right over it because it's a, the, it's a really, uh, it's more complex part and we don't really need it. Uh, but the distribution means that uh, I can connect Erlang nodes that are running Erlang together and they talk through TCP so then the protocol this is all transparent so I just connect them and then I can spawn a process so as, same as we spawned processes uh, like uh, here. So we spawn this process here. I can say uh, node.spawn and I give it a node name that I don't have now, but uh, I can give it a node name and that it will spawn this process on another node, so in a distributed environment. Um, and then I, w I s will still get a, a PID back, so the same as we get here. I will get a PID and then it's transparent to me that I that I, this process is living on another node. I can send messages to it and receive messages to it transparently, even if it's on another node. Uh, of course, you have less guarantees, but um, but the idea is you program, uh, the, it's really easy to distribute your application, then you can put some parts of your application 
uh, somewhere, other parts in another node, and these are physically living on different machines, for example, uh, and then they just work usually. Uh, of course, it is like generally a bad idea to do this bl blindly, but um, it's really, the language makes it really easy to do, uh, really transparent to do uh, anyways. And this was the, the just the very, very broad introduction to the language. So do, do you have any questions? Uh, please feel, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Um, so of course you, you, you will probably be saying I didn't get anything. Uh, that's, that's okay. I, I just like, I want to get you interested in this and then get your mind uh, like thinking about this. Um, and the, the next part that we're actually going to use all, all of this is, is this um, game, right? So, but to explain the game, I, I have to uh, kind of introduce the Phoenix, which is the uh, web framework for Elixir that I used to make this game. Um, and it's, if you know, probably most of you know Ra Rails uh, and, uh, or Django, and um, Phoenix is very similar to those uh, in some way. It's like an M MVC um, web framework um, built in Elixir. Um, and the really first I super interesting thing, I think, uh, is that uh, it's built, like it uses an H HTTP serv um, server that is written in Erlang, but the point is the same. And how does this server take, like HTTP server take advantage of all the stuff that we talked about? So in, in the HTTP server that Phoenix uses, every request that a client does spawns a new process in the server. And this is like, can you imagine like having a million uh, people connected to your server and that's just each, each connection is a process. So you have a million processes running on the server and it's just fine. And if an error happens in one uh, process, it will just affect that user and it will not affect any other user that are disconnected to your server. And since we have supervisor, what happens, like you, you don't restart the process of course because it probably was doing work that you lost but what you can do is this process dies then the supervisor catches this, this death and sends a message to the client saying there was an internal server error, for example, but just to the client, so you don't affect the rest of your application. And then, of course, you get, like, this is a bonus, but you get, like, uh, con super concurrency, um, basically just for free. So you program this, uh, you, you don't do anything in particular, but this, like, becomes super concurrent just by design, and if you add cores to your machine, for example, this just becomes more fast. Uh, and if you add more cores, it just becomes faster. And, and the, like, it's proven, uh, it happened to people that the limit is, is reached when uh, uh, your computer runs out of file descriptors for sockets, not when you run out of processes, Erlang processes. Because Erlang processes just, like, until you have memory, they will just, just be spawned and it will, will not care about uh, and anything else. So, and this is like a really good, in interesting part, I think. But uh, but this is not Phoenix. This is really like the server that Phoenix uses. Uh, the really cool thing I think about Phoenix is actually uh, channels, basically. So what are channels? So Phoenix builds. This is something that Rails actually added after Phoenix. So maybe they they copied to Phoenix. But um, so channels are are they build this really nice abstraction over message passing. Uh, so similar to Elixir message passing that we showed earlier, uh, where you send and receive messages, so they built this abstraction of channels, um, and they're they're still made to send and receive messages. But the idea is that you have um, transports that are actually swappable. So you have uh, the tr this tra transport is pluggable, um, and this is the transport is the way you explain how to send and receive messages. So for example, uh, the default transport that Phoenix uses is web sockets, and so you have a channel living on the server and one living on the client, uh, and they communicate through message, through web sockets, sorry, that's the transport, and the semantics are like message passing in Elixir, though it's just two, basically two processes reacting uh, on sending and receiving messages between, between them. And you have other, you can, the transport is swappable, so you have, uh, for example, you can build the transport, I don't know, out of RabbitMQ, for example, uh, or you can build uh, uh, they have long polling built in, so if you don't have web sockets, they, they will just ask the server a lot of times uh, if there are new messages, and, and like to you it's transparent, it's just abstracted away, even if the transport uh, is different. And this concept, um, so this is what, like a re really cool thing I think that Phoenix introduced. Uh, and to get more into detail, uh, basically, channels are based, are live inside sockets, and the socket is actually 
uh, the connection that you have with the uh, client, right? So in, in the WebSocket example, the socket is the actual connection to the browser, TCP connection to the browser where WebSockets uh, talks. Uh, and channels are, an abstract, like they live inside the socket, so a socket can have multiple channels. And uh, when this becomes really interesting is that a socket is a process, as we said, like as we said for the um, HTTP requests connections. So a socket is a process, an elixir process on the server. Um, so it, it has all the benefits of like isolated crashes, concurrency, uh, but a channel is a process as well in the socket. So it's, it's a different process basically. It's just like connected to the same socket, but it's a different process. So you get uh, super concurrency, like as many channels as you want, and they will run in parallel uh, for each user basically. Um, and this scales, it turns out that it scales really well. Um, and this is like, this communication through uh, channels is how you build, um, how I build the game. That's, that's basically it. Uh, and this is how you build, uh, you can build a lot of like real time stuff with this because you, you, you see the pattern of like uh, sending or receiving messages. It's like it, it, you can send and receive both ways, right? So it's really easy to build real time stuff for you from the server. You push to the client and the client reacts. Uh, so, so what I want to do right now is like actually show you some code, not of the game yet, but of the, it, like it's really stupid chat app that, that you can build with Phoenix where I type stuff and it comes um, and you see the message as soon as I type it. So I have a, like a small, um, yeah, demo here. Yes, so, so I have this app, I just generated this app with Phoenix, it has a bunch of like scaffolding uh, stuff. Um, and I just wanna show that if I run uh, mix phoenix dot server, and then I go here, it just says, I mean, it's, it's working. This is serving this page, uh, and it's just, uh, so this is just like an empty application. So what we can do is actually, uh, this is not, I'm doing this to avoid live coding because it's boring for everyone, but uh, it's definitely hard for me, not boring, but. Uh, so I'm just like basically just moving through commits and showing the stuff, the, the diff basically. Uh, so in this commit, what we did is just uh, nothing because there's no, uh, where is, oh sorry. There you go. Um, so uh, basically this commit, we just, uh, so the application was empty. So what we did is we just um, went to the, uh, let's say user socket file. We just uncommented this line that says route channels that have this shape, basically room, colon, anything to a room channel process. And this is this is executed on the, as I said, the user socket, so the actual web socket connection. So when it connects and it says, okay, start a channel on, on like room uh, and a room, then it will say, uh, it will r route this to the room channel module. And then, um, so this, nothing happens on the, nothing changed on the browser. So if I move, uh, to the next commit, then we can see that I actually now have this room channel module. And this is just a module that defines a join function. Uh, and for, so for now we allow users only to connect to their uh, lobby room. And if return okay socket is just meaning, okay, this user is connected. So you, you can do, for example, authentication here, but it's, we don't care about that now. Uh, and now if we actually do this here, we still see, uh, okay, so we actually changed the JavaScript here as well. So we changed this uh, this bit of JavaScript here. So what, what the client is now doing is like establishing the socket connection and it's giving some params that we actually don't have so we can remove those, but we, we won't. Um, so it's just establishing the socket connection and then it's connecting to the socket, then it's starting this channel to the connected to the room uh, lobby top topic basically. Uh, and then it's joining, and then if everything goes well, it executes this callback, uh, this is clear, it executes this callback and it just prints join successfully, and that's what we saw in the, oops, 
the what we saw in the console here join successfully. So that's that's just what happened. If I move more, um, so in this commit we just like did something really silly, which is uh, add. Uh, so we should have index. Yeah, we added uh, like a chat input to the HTML page. Now we see this here. So we just intercepting the event in JavaScript, uh, and we capture what it what's written in it, and we uh, flush it here. Uh, and we still don't do anything here. This is like the base of the chat, right? You write something and you send it. Uh, and now if we move to the next commit, then what changed in the JavaScript code, um, there you go, is actually, uh, we, so we, we have this event listener, instead of like printing this to the console, we actually push this to the server, right? So we push this message with the body of the value of the input, uh, but right now the, our room channel is not handling, oh, all right, it's handling this already, like, perfect. Uh, so this is actually uh, handling this right now, uh, and when this, a message called new message comes in, we have the body, uh, what we do is we broadcast this to all other subscribers, this is how chat works, right? You send a message and you broadcast to everyone participating in the chat. Uh, so we broadcast this message to everyone else and then we just keep, keep going. Uh, and the way, so the only thing missing right now is the, uh, so if we do this here, sorry, here, uh, again, it will still just uh, not print because it's now not print to the console because it's now pushing to the uh, actual server, but it's not doing anything yet. So what we need to do is actually uh, handle this on the client side. So if we now uh, refresh this file, uh, we see that we, have the, we can actually bind a callback to a message that comes from the channel. So in this case, we're binding uh, this callback to a message that's coming, and we say, just create a new element. Uh, so if we look at the HTML, we see we are now have not like a list of messages here. Um, and we just connect to this, and we uh, append the, this text, like the body of the, that we sent and the date, uh, and we append it to the list. And this, this on your message, is, this is when we broadcast, so the client receives the message and, and it handles it here. So now, if I actually write something, it appears here, right? But the interesting thing uh, is if I actually do this. Yeah, so this is just a chat. So it's just talking like as soon as I push this here, it, it pushes in the, on the other tab. And this, of course, works for any number of tabs just any number of users and it will probably work. And like, it's really interesting to know that this worked for, like they made it work for millions of people, this stupid example. And it has like one uh, second delay when giving, giving the message to a million people connected to the chat. That's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, and basically that's uh, it for the chat. Uh, just to show, like showcase these web sockets and this, the real time stuff that you can do. Um, and then we can get to the game, which is just a really silly game, uh, and it's called, I have it online so that anyone can join. Uh, it's called this really stupid stuff. So, so if you want to join from your phone, it's Sheltered Caverns 26432. Dotterrockwap.com, uh, of course it's not, yes. Awkward stories. So my, my username is Andrea. I just start, so you know the game when you, so wait for joining. Uh, you know the game that says, like, yeah, I, I say a word, then you say a word, then the next one says a word, and we all make up a story, right? Saying word, one word each. So uh, this is just the same thing in the browser. So a user is selected at random every eight seconds, and then it has a chance to write a word. So I, I will create a story create a, called no slides conf, and then you connect to this and say, uh, stories no slides conf after the URL, so just type in this very long URL, please. Um, and I'm the only one, so it's just always choosing me as the next writer. So if I say I, and then I just, I wait for the eight seconds to pass, and then I say M. Is anyone trying to connect? It will be much cooler if, if it's more than Mary, oh, there you go, quick. OK, 
Jesus Ale is the next writer. Just be, be funny. Ah, too fast. Yeah, all right. The more users you get, all right, that's me. But. Jesus, it's an important guest. Ja. You're ruining it, oh my god. <laughs> so the, the idea was just like, I will talk in the meantime. The idea is that, like you can see this, this it, it gets real time, real fast. Um, I mean, you can, this is like, I, I will, I can show you the implementation of this, but it's really silly. It's just you have on the server, you have something that has all the users connected and then it just every eight seconds selects a user then broadcasts this, this user to everyone. Uh, and, and that's why you see the current writer. Uh, and then when, when the, someone writes a word and the turn uh, finishes, then the word is saved on the server and broadcasted to everyone else. So I can just, uh, but you're not writing a story. I, I don't, <sighs> commit more, focus. But anyways, uh, this is the, and the implementation is really, really, uh, we can last, just look at the channel. I think it's interesting. Room channel. So this is just, this is the whole code for the channel, like st stupidest code ever. And it just uh, says, no, this is the stupidest code ever because it's not the correct application. So let's, yes. Story channel, that, that's more. Uh, so it's just saying, this is just a, the join messages that's accepting the join. So when a new word comes, we append the word to the actual story that you're writing to, um, and then we broadcast this word to everyone, and then that's how you display it. Um, and instead, in the story module, that's, that's how like a sto a story, each story uh, runs. Um, then you, when you have uh, append word, you execute, uh, sorry, when you have um, elected next writer, elect next writer, this is every eight seconds this gets executed. And what you do is basically broadcast next writer election. I, I mean, this is just broadcasting the next writer to everyone. And then it's just uh, starting again and after eight seconds sending it again. All right, we're out of time. Uh, this isn't a good story. I'm really disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there's... <laughs> just, just a note, this is all built on Elixir, so there's no way this is gonna work, sorry. Is, there's no database behind this, so. <laughs> yeah, do you have any questions? Do we have time for questions? I, I'm not a jerk. Yeah, you can have coffee break, of course. <laughs> but there's no coffee break, so you can have questions instead if you want. There's a guy in the back with a huge dog. No? I'm kidding. There's no guy in the back with a huge dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was my turn. Thank you. Uh, a simple question. Why should I learn Elixir instead of Erlang? All right, that's a good question. So the answer is yes. Um, so you should learn Elixir instead of Erlang. You should learn both, both first. Uh, so you, there's no way you're going to learn Elixir and not learn Erlang. Uh, because Elixir, uh, it's, so it's built on Erlang, and I didn't show, but uh, there's actually, you basically, oops. Um, so if I go back in the shell and I say like, there are some stuff. There's some stuff that is not being imported from Elixir, from Erlang to Elixir. So one example is the like crypto module to do cryptographic stuff. So, so if you want like uh, like random bytes, what you do is uh, this syntax. Uh, random bytes, ten bytes, uh, and this is like this crypto is actually the Erlang module. We're just calling the Erlang module. 
and call, calling this function on the Erlang module, so it's just transparent. And since it's built on Erlang, everything else is shared, like the data structure is shared. All the, all the code reading in Erlang you can use from Elixir, uh, functions are the same, everything is the same. Uh, so if you learn Elixir, you definitely learn Erlang as well. But the reason to learn Elixir is that there's a lot of, it's first, it, uh, like one one reason is definitely that it's way more user friendly than Erlang. Erlang is like a pretty old language, and it was not built with from the from the ground up with like developers in mind. It was just like let's do business, like let's do telephone switches, like all the all day, all night. Uh, and then uh, it has way better tooling right now. Erlang is catching up a bit, but uh, Elixir has a really really great uh, build tool, like like similar to Make, but uh, or Rake. Uh, it has a really great uh, unit test framework. Uh, it has a really good shell, so it has like generally better tooling uh, than Erlang. And then it has a bunch of really nice ab abstractions that Erlang doesn't have. And one I really love is, is streams. So if you're familiar with Haskell, for example, and uh, like lazy, uh, lazy computational uh, lists and all this stuff, so you can do the same in Elixir with streams. So you, you instead of like mapping over a collection and doing operation on each item of a collection and then like for, for all the collection and then doing another one on the new collection and then like chaining this operation you can do this, this lazy, lazy uh, in a lazy way and you can actually just like store the computation and then ex execute all the computation at once for each element of the collection. This goes for example for infinite collections as well. Um, so it has a generally like a bunch of nice abstractions uh, that Erlang doesn't doesn't have uh, that make programming kind of easier and and more fun. But if you want to learn Erlang, I'm 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 fine with it. You, you can you can learn Erlang as well. Yeah. Do you have uh, any suggestion from for someone that want to learn Elixir? Uh, yeah, sure. So so I would su just suggest to go to the the. the I will read this story later, but. Uh, so the like elixir lang dash lang dot org website. And there's a this is a really learning elixir. No, there's a really guides. That, there you go. This this is like this is introduct introductive guide. It's I think it's really nice. This is where where I started. To be honest, you just read through this. Uh, there's a nice book called Programming Elixir from um, um, Pragmatic Programmers, and there's Meta Programming Elixir on the wave of Meta Programming Ruby. Uh, there are a bunch of books out there for for Elixir, and uh, but I think the, like you start with this guide and then you just pick it up. Uh, it's, I think it's quite simple language at its core. The, like the hard thing to learn is the, all the ecosystem of uh, like Erlang stuff that is available and all the processes, architecture, all this stuff. But the language itself is you will find most of the stuff you need here probably. And how is the um, developer market for uh, Elixir Lang? Uh, and there is so so like like jobs finding yeah. jobs. Uh, I have a job with Elixir, so for me it's really good. Uh, but now I think it's it's definitely rising. Uh, it's it's so it's uh, growing way faster than than Erlang. So Erlang has been quite quite like. Um, Stable and and like a niche for for a lot of time, but uh, Elixir kind of brought this uh, the whole virtual machine back to life because it's interesting people that are were not interested before. Uh, so right now the Elixir in particular is is going quite well. A lot of um, uh, companies are mi migrating from like rail, Rails mostly, uh, but generally uh, migrating to Elixir from a bunch of stuff, and they want like. People, I, I, I mean, I really. Like, uh, there's a, a ton of uh, jobs board. I think there's some, someone. Elixir jobs, maybe. Yeah. Sorry. Functional works. Uh, a site for functional related. Uh, ah, jobs. okay. I didn't know. Yeah, this one is just Elixir specific. There's, yeah, there's a ton of jobs. There you go. Yeah. Okay.